The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology and mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often over and over again. As soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit the three of us pray a lot about this series. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined. We are imperfect. And we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. So I've been listening not only to the people up front, but I've also been listening to you, to your questions. And I think that a number of you, if not all of you, are feeling called to change. You're feeling called to do more at a minimum. And so I want to see if I have something to offer you from 35 years of doing justice through Christian community development, faith-rooted community organizing, biblically-based public policy advocacy that can help you as you discern. One of the most important mentors in my life has been Reverend James M. Lawson Jr., who Dr. King called his theologian of nonviolence. Reverend Lawson says that of uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, where the, there's the battle between Elijah and the false prophets, and they build these towers, Right? of wood and they sacrifice a bull and then the divine fire comes down onto Elijah's tower. And Jim says, if they hadn't built those towers of wood and sacrificed those bulls, there would be nothing for the fire to burn. It would not have come down. Building those piles is tedious, frustrating, painful. <laughs> it is. So I want to say to you that the only way that we sustain that is, first of all, to, know, to not try to do it alone. Yep. 
I mean, and not even as a church, not just as an individual, as a church, there are coalitions out there because the Holy Spirit is at work before you start. So, you know, I'm part of a coalition we call Matthew 25, a coalition, a bipartisan Christian coalition to protect and defend the vulnerable in the name of Jesus at this historical moment. That's just one coalition. Anything you care about, anything that is breaking your heart, there are coalitions. Go and be part. Number two, when you go and be part, be in the world and not of the world. Bring all your gifts as the church. Be the church. So I want to mention three ways that we need to be the church as we move into these coalitions, that we need to be the body. The first one goes back to what Chris said. If we do not come together across the lines, we will not, the world will not know that Jesus has come. <laughs> and, and that's not fun. That's not easy. I mean, it's easy at first when you're being Barney, you know, I love you, you love me. It's easy at first. <laughs> not easy over time right? People talk about John 17, you know, as having, as being ecumenical, right? But the world doesn't care if Baptists and Methodists get together, I promise you. But if immigrants and non-immigrants are together, yes. So, so do the work to actually build those relationships, but make sure, number two, that they are just relationships. You know, 1 Corinthians 12, about the body, doesn't just say we need each other. In verse 24, it says, give more honor to the parts that have lacked it so that there would be no dissension in the body. Woo! We think if we give more honor to the parts that lacked it, there will be more dissension in the body. No, so that there will not be dissension in the body, but we will have equal care for each other. God's affirmative action policy. So work to create just relationships. And number three... Uh, actually, I want to say one more thing about number two. We've worked very hard in the work that I do at metrics for being the body. You really have to look practically. Who makes the decisions? When do you make the decisions? Is everybody there when you made it? Where are you making the decisions? Can everybody get there? Right? You really have to ask the hard questions if you're going to share power, if you're going to be the body. Um, number three come with the full power of the Holy Spirit. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, which means the power of the dove. So I could talk to you for the next hour about what that means, and we could talk together about what that means. But all I want to say about that right now is that Renee August from South Africa, she's one of the students of Desmond Tutu. She's an Episcopal priest. When she talks about what they've done in South Africa, she says the difference between a sprint and a marathon is how you breathe. So coming into the coalitions in the full power of the Holy Spirit means breathing, breathing, breathing. And then Pablo Alvarado of the National Day Laborers Organizing Network says that if you're going to give birth to a baby, you have to breathe and push at the appropriate time. So it means as we work together, as we bring the, our full gifts to the coalitions, as we work together justly, as we bring the full power of the Holy Spirit with us, as we meet the Spirit where we are in the community, that we have to encourage one another. Encouragement literally means to give courage. When you leave this place to be able to respond to the call that you are hearing, you must have the courage to do all that you've heard. And that will require, my brothers and sisters, that we encourage each other, that we give each other courage, that we call each other to breathe and push. And you know, when I was giving birth for 29 hours of labor, <laughs> I'm so proud of it. I survived. It was a long time ago. Um, I, I could not have done it if my husband didn't breathe with me and if he didn't call me to push. So I would say with each other, Breathe with each other. Call each other to push. Thank you. Amen.